You know, I've seen throughout my years so many people around the world that were not satisfied with how God created them and they always strive to look like something else or sometimes someone else. I remember that person who, I don't know how many dollars he invested in cosmetic surgeries, but he wanted to look like Ken, the mate of Barbie. Isn't that interesting? By the way, that same person later on wasn't satisfied with how he looked as Ken and became Barbie. See, there is no end to what people want to do to themselves when they are not satisfied because they have no clue in what image God has created them. We're in one of the most iconic locations right in the center of the city of Tel Aviv, the capital of Israeli cultural life. People come to this place from all over the country to watch a nice performance. And it's interesting because oftentimes when we hear the singer, we want to be like him. We want to sing like the singer, act like the actor. We want to be like them. These people oftentimes become an icon to us. And I was thinking about it. I was asking, what is an icon? Looking at the dictionary, you see that an icon is related to three different categories. People, smartphones, and specific paintings. It's very interesting because when it goes to the people, it's either a famous person or a thing that is used by society to represent a set of beliefs or a way of life. But when it comes to the smartphone or a computer, it's a small picture or a symbol on the screen of those devices that once you click on it, it makes the device do something. No matter what, an icon stimulates something. An icon makes you think about something do something, react to something. People oftentimes are not satisfied with who they are. A question that should be asked is, should people imitate others? Many years ago, I graduated the Officers Academy in the Israeli military. And I remember that when I arrived in that solitary base in the middle of the desert in southern Israel, and there was a courtyard, a courtyard that no one was allowed to walk on. That courtyard is reserved only to the final graduation ceremony. And if you want to step on it, you need to graduate. But the one thing that captured my attention in that courtyard was actually that verse from the book of Judges, chapter 7. A verse that says in Hebrew, Mimeni tiru v'chen ta'asu. Look at me and do likewise. In other words, in the Bible, we actually have an advice not a commandment, but an advice to look at other people and do likewise. In this case, by the way, is the story of uh, Gideon when he told his soldiers, not too many of them that left, look how we're going to win against the Midianites. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hands. And then he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. 
Gideon didn't tell them, look at me, at my character, look at me, at how nice I look. He just said, if we want to win this battle, you need to listen to me and you need to do what I do. And that's the essence of the commander in the Israeli military. They go always forward and they expect their soldiers to do what they do. You know, I grew up without a father. I never had a role model in my life. And uh, reaching the Officers Academy was the first time I felt the need and the will and the desire to look at someone else and do likewise. But we're also being told in the Bible who not to be with, what not to learn from people. 3 John chapter 1, verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. One important thing we need to learn is to follow spiritual examples and not earthly, not worldly ones. There is no end to the ridiculous attempt of men, mankind, to look like something else or someone else. And I think that it's because they miss out the one and only they need to look like. Now, what is the will of God? You see, so far we concentrated on the will of man to look like something or someone. But what is the will of God? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Wow! Now we understand that what God wants is that those who love Him, those who are called according to His purpose, whom He foreknew, that means that He called them, at some point He knew they will respond because He knows all things. He knows the things we haven't even done yet. Those people, He wants them to conform to the image of His Son. Image in Greek is ikonos or icon. I have a question to you. Can we really look like God physically? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to Him? Nobody can compare to God because God is a spirit. He doesn't have a blue eyes, blonde hair. These are just artists rendering when they try to maybe paint something. But God is a spirit and we cannot look like God physically. And it's very interesting because before sin entered the world, Adam was actually created in the image and the likeness of God, but he actually was having some godly attributes. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the apostle writes, For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. In other words, in order to to be holy, we need to behold God's holiness. And we need to be holy for He is holy. And that is exactly what we've lost when sin entered the world. Sin shattered the godly image and with it the eternal life that Adam had. You know, Adam was not meant to die. God never created Adam to die. God actually warned Adam not to do something that will lead to his death. In other words, God wanted him to live. Is that why they were naked after they have sinned? Because sin has entered the world? What is it exactly that made them naked? You know, in Genesis 3, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Something happened that 
took away the spiritual, spiritual glory that was covering man. And now in the physical, carnal essence, they were naked. And they had to find a way to cover themselves. Shame came. Guilt came. They were hiding. They were covering. The spiritual sight was lost. And the carnal was left. And that's why Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. Separation. Now God is hiding from us. He's hiding His face from us. He's not even listening to us. Why? Because there is unholiness, ungodliness, and sinfulness. And that is the opposite of who God is. He is holy. Now, in order to restore man's ability to see God as he used to, God sent his son. John chapter 1, 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. And the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the first time, humans can see God. We beheld His glory. The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Remember, Adam and Eve, before the sin, could walk in the garden, and God was walking. There was a fellowship there. Beautiful, beautiful fellowship of of a God and His crown jewel of creation. And so, in order for man to restore his union with God, man needed to see God full of grace and full of truth. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And in order for him to restore our fellowship with God and to be able to see God, he needed to do something very simple, but very important. And the most crucial of all, purging out sin had to be the first step. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter one, verses three and four, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty of nigh, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Jesus could only return back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father after he made the most important thing for which he came to this world, the purging of our sins. Purging out sin was only possible through one act, which is through his redemptive death. The life of Jesus were amazing, but the death of Jesus was necessary and the resurrection had to obviously show that this death is not a death of a man, but God himself. Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay down my life and I can take it back. And so he did. Only God can give life and take life. Hebrews 2 verses 9 to 11. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for what? For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone, not for himself. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Second Corinthians says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus is the icon, the image of God. He's the one we need to strive to look like, to be like, to act like. 
to talk like and to serve like. That person should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When you looked at him, you saw the light of the glory of God, the same light that God commanded to have when he created this world. It's hard for us to grasp, to understand what the disciples saw when they saw Jesus. The light, the, the, the authority, everything about him. So we can only change through the Word of God. He is the Word. And only through the Word of God, now when Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, we're left with the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit. And that is enough to change us. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When you become a believer and the Word of God is right in front of you and the Holy Spirit is in you, suddenly you understand there's a lot of things you need to cut off from your life. And it's painful. It's a sword. It's even sharper than that. We can only change through the Holy Spirit. If we don't have not just the Word of God in front of us, but the Holy Spirit that can only come to us once we believe in Him, it won't work. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, were being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We can see the glory of God through the Word of God. So, if Jesus is the one we need to strive to look like, be like, and talk like, and if He is the icon we really need to have in our life, how can we be like Him even today? Look, He's not around us. He's not sitting next to me physically. I cannot touch Him. I cannot see Him. This is something that you know, the disciples had, and I think they wished they understood then how precious it was and did not waste some of their conversations on futile things. So how can we today be like Jesus? First of all, the topic of being conformed to the image of Jesus is a very vast and huge topic. But I concentrated eight points that are something that we can apply to our lives even today. The first point I want to address is how we can actually teach the Word of God with the wisdom and the authority that He had if we know Him and His Word. Matthew 7, And so it was when Jesus had ended these saying that the people were astonished at His teaching, for He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Why did Jesus have authority? Because He was the Word of God. When He was teaching, it wasn't, oh, let me give you my interpretation, my feeling, my thoughts. No. The Word of God can only teach the Word of God with authority because He is the Word. Whatever Jesus said about the Old Testament is what the Old Testament really meant because He is the Word. And so when we look at what He said, and then we read back the Old Testament, we better now understand exactly what it meant in light of what the Word who became flesh was saying. The second thing we can be even today like Him is that zeal for God's house, for our church, for our congregation, wherever it is, zeal to keep it holy, to keep it in line with the Word of God, with the teachings, with everything. Not to lose it to the world, not to conform to the world like so many churches do. You know, John chapter 2, it says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When, when he had made a weep of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out all the changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, 
take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. And that's, of course, Psalm 69. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up. That's how we need to be. We cannot allow our own congregation become a marketplace. I've seen so many churches around the world where it was all about money. It was all about selling stuff. And it's so sad because the, they put so much effort in making money than trusting God for the money because they don't even teach the Word of God and they don't even follow His example. A third thing is caring for the flock. We need to understand that we are surrounded by people who may need us. John 10 says, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life. What for? For the sheep. Jesus cared for the sheep. He cared for the people around Him. He cared for the people that God gave to His hands. So much so that He was willing to give His life for them. I'm not sure I can say that about myself. I'm not sure there is any person in my congregation or people that are surrounding me that I will say, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay dying for that person. I wish I could say that. The fourth point is serving rather than being served. And that's something that is so hard for leaders to do. Because, look, a lot of people honor us and they want to serve us. And we can get used to it. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Wow. I mean, the Son of Man... The Son of God, God in the flesh, the Word of God, the one that should be served by us, came not to be served, but to serve. Maybe we need to learn from it. Don't you think so? The fifth one is meekness and humility. Another point that Christians many times struggle with. In Matthew 11, it says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus said, learn from me. Here I am in front of you. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm thinking at how many times we actually make our lives so miserable when we tend to deal with things by our own strength and we carry the burden instead of giving him. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's like an exchange. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'll take yours. That's my point. This is my job. I came to bear your yoke and I am now giving you mine. And mine is easy and mine is because I am gentle and lowly in heart. In other words, he says, look, I actually came as a servant, as a poor and as a lowly, not even from a priestly family, nothing. I was born in a manger. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls if you come to me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we need to be at least gentle and meek as he was when we come and approach other people, so they can actually find in us rest and not a burden. You know, so many people are so strong in their personality. They're so proud and arrogant. Then when you come to speak to them, they're actually giving you anxiety. It's like pressure on you that is being built. That's not what we need to be like. Number six is total surrender to the will of God. We know the will of God. We know because God wrote in his word, his will. Philippians chapter two, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of a man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death 
of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He came and he fulfilled the plan of God. He did not say, hey, I'm your Son, I, I, I need to stay in heaven. Send someone else. No, <laughs> no. You know, the Bible says that he was not considering it robbery to be equal with God, but actually he, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a bondservant. How about that? Just so he can fulfill the plan of God. He knew it, it is necessary. Luke chapter 22, he said, Father, if it is your will... Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In the flesh, Jesus, of course, nobody wants to die. Certainly not a death on the cross. But he knew there is a plan. And he knew that it has to be done. And he knew that the will of God, not the will of man, has to be executed. Number seven, determination to fulfill the will of God. Isaiah chapter 50 verses 5 to 7. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheek to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. What a determination. Set my face as a flint. I knew where I'm going. I was ready. I'm determined. And I'm not letting all these sufferings deter me. Wow. Number eight is faithfulness to complete what we have begun. So many Christians start well. So many of us, we had a wonderful experience when we got saved. We think, wow, we can do this and we can do that. And we start something and then wind and the storms of life come. And we tend to forget what we have started and what we have begun. And we tend not to complete it. Jesus said to them in John 4, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. And not just to do it, and to finish his work. Don't stop halfway. Don't stop a third of the way. Don't even stop 90% of the way. Finish his work. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God will always complete what he has to do because that's who he is. On the cross, Jesus said it is finished. Complete it. Having mentioned all these eight points is nice, but let's face it, so many of us are looking forward to the day that we will actually physically be like him. When our physical body will be redeemed. <laughs> I love what Romans 8.23 says, Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. This body, the Bible calls it a tent. It's lowly. This body is sinful. This body cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This body cannot enter the presence of God. It's full of sin. Once you become a believer, you have a new mind, a new heart, new spirit, but your body is still sinful. 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery, he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible 
must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal put on immortality, then it shall be brought to pass the saying, as it's written, death is swallowed up in victory. Remember, Philippians chapter 3 says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Lord, the Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body. When He resurrected from the dead, it was already a glorious one. So we're going to start by looking at Him, following His word, being filled with His Spirit and becoming like Him in the way we talk, in the way we behave, in the way we conduct ourselves. And the day will come, and it's very soon, that even our physical body is going to be wearing glory, just as His glorious body was. Who is your icon? It better be the one that God wants you to be like, to be conformed to the image of His Son.